Welcome to the Pulsus Research and Profile Series. My name is Andrew Phillips, and today I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Sebastian Kampf, talking about his latest book, Saving Soldiers or Civilians, Casualty Aversion versus Civilian Protection in Asymmetric Conflict. Welcome, Seb. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks for having me. Not at all. It's terrific to have you here. I'm just interested to start with what motivated you to write this book. Two particular conflicts that I was watching, the first one or following, the first one was Kosovo in 1999, which for me really brought out an interesting tension that has concerned me within US warfare ever since, namely the tension between the reluctance to risk the lives of your own soldiers, what I call casualty aversion, and the um, imperative to spare innocent civilian lives, civilian protection. And Kosovo, in a way, had these particular norms sit in strong tension with one another because of the way in which the Americans waged that war. The second one was the events of 9-11 and the subsequent wars that we have seen. And in particular, what crystallized for me out of this was the asymmetric dimension. And in particular, in a way, the creativity with which Al-Qaeda managed to exploit the vulnerabilities that we have seen in American society. And so, in a way, what the book does is brings these two interests that I saw in Kosovo and 9-11 together. Yeah, I'm really fascinated to hear if you could elaborate a little bit more on the way in which these non-Western, non-state adversaries have been able to manipulate that tension between casualty aversion, civilian protection. How does that actually play out in practice? Well, the point I'm making in the book is that the two norms of casualty aversion, civilian protection have come to underpin contemporary US warfare. But once these two particular tensions come in contact with the interactive dynamics that we see in war, i.e. once the US fights its adversaries in Somalia, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and in other places, we see that these adversaries have identified these two particular norms within US warfare as areas of vulnerability. They see it as the center of gravity, the biggest weakness of US warfare, and try to exploit them subsequently. So can you give us an empirical illustration of that? What does that actually look like in practice? So I'm doing three particular case studies, Somalia in the early 1990s, um, Afghanistan and Iraq after 9-11. And across the three cases, what we see, for example, with regards to the exploitation of the norm of civilian protection, is that whether it is IDEED or warlords or Al-Qaeda or the Taliban or insurgents, they, for example, all use human shields. They use crowd swarming techniques to bring civilians close to their enemy forces to be able to hit them from behind. They all locate some of their strategic assets within densely populated areas, trying to provoke Americans to c generate collateral damage. That's one way in which they have tried to exploit civilian protection, making it more difficult to differentiate between themselves and the civilian population within which they are embedded. So like Black Hawk Down. That's right. Very good example of that. But what you also see in Black Hawk Down, as, as well as in the subsequent cases, is they also try to exploit casualty aversion. The perceived inability on part of the Americans to stomach the sight of the blood of their own soldiers. And then what we see throughout is a very strong conviction amongst these US adversaries that if you just kill one American soldier, you can make life very, very difficult for US administrations. Kill a handful or more, they start running and withdrawing. That's in the way the big lesson that they have learned from Vietnam, from Lebanon, and subsequently from Somalia. So looking at your argument, this idea of that Americans face a painful choice between preserving these two competing values, you know, casualty aversion, civilian protection, how in practice have Americans sought to reconcile those values and have they been making the right choice in your view? Okay, so the choice that the Americans had to make was born out of the adversaries exploiting civilian protection casualty version. So putting them in a position where they have to make that choice. That's right. And it's terrible either way they make that choice. Yeah, and in all the three cases that I look at, the Americans decided to prioritize the lives of their own soldiers of the lives of enemy civilians. In the sense, transferring the combat risks from their own soldiers to enemy civilians. And the immediate result of that choice is that American forces start killing more enemy civilians. That's what you can see through Somalia, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Now, 
you know, in a way that puts the logic of what it means to be a soldier and what it means to be a civilian on its head. Of course. Right? Yeah. C civilians are supposed to be spared from the fallout of war as well, and soldiers are, you know, supposed to accept the risk of dying in war. So that kind of choice points in the opposite direction. So I was interested in then looking at what does that mean in terms of the laws of war? You know, does that constitute a violation of the laws of war? And interesting enough, it doesn't. I've meticulously investigated these three case studies and that particular behavior, and I couldn't find that this was not in compliance with the laws of war, which, you know, in a, in a different way also shows us the problems of the laws of war. They're very, very permissive. There's a big gray zone where it's not really clear of you know, for example, how many risks US soldiers would have to take to spare civilians. But in essence, making that kind of choice doesn't necessarily lead or hasn't led in these three cases to a violation of the laws of war. And so is the implication or upshot of your argument then that faced with that choice between protecting their own soldiers and protecting the lives of foreign civilians, uh, is the argument of the book or is an implication of your argument that Americans should in future lean more towards favouring civilian protection over casualty aversion? Yes, that's in a way what I do through an investigation where I use just war tradition and Michael Waltz's idea of due care to look at counterfactually whether more civilian lives could have been saved if American forces had accepted higher levels of risk to themselves. Okay. within limits. And what I can s show and find, or what I found and what I can show in the book, is that in each of those cases, there were several areas or instances where higher levels of American risks to their own forces would have reduced enemy civilian casualties very significantly. And that's an important argument, because ultimately, if we look back at Somalia, we look at Afghanistan, we look at Iraq, we see that these are not successful military operations of the Americans, far from it. They're either direct losses, they're incomplete, and the Americans were not really able to fulfill their own military objectives. And the reason for this is that in each of these cases, the large number of civilian protections really backfired and thwarted US objectives. So in a way, accepting higher risks themselves would have made it more likely that they can fulfill or achieve the objectives that they had in the very first place. That's a really fascinating finding. Uh, finally, one brief question. Um, is the upshot of your book as a result of all of your analysis that the United States and the West more generally should simply try to avoid these kinds of asymmetric conflicts wherever they can in future? That's not the point it makes at all. I think that they will, first of all, they will continue being involved in these types of conflicts. But I think it's important to get it right. Um, and to get it right means to actually not just comply with the laws of war, but to accept that there are much more restrictive ways in which they need to view the protection of civilians. And I'm not saying this from a deontological, good-hearted type of way, as someone who sits in an ivory tower and thinks about these things. I would have expected nothing less from you, sir. Absolutely. But it has actually strategic repercussions, right? Because the argument is, unless you're willing to accept higher risks to your soldiers and thereby save civilian lives, you're very unlikely to actually win these types of war in the first place. Yeah, as I said, it's a terrific book and a fascinating set of findings. So I'd like to congratulate you once again and thank you so much for joining us on Research and Profile.